Now I would like to invite to the top table Dr. Suzanne Basiri, Director of Administration and Finance Division. We will consider the following progress report. Report on accountability and compliance of the WHO Regional Office for Europe. The report is in EUR slash RC69 slash 8C. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Basiri for a short introduction. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> DDG, RD, RD elect, uh, acting RD, distinguished delegate. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to present to you a progress report on compliance and risk, as it has been for the last few years to the regional committee. We have been... Uh, we have started systematic approach to risk management um, in the last few years across the organization. And in Euro, we have been quite on track in terms of this work. For 2018-19, our risk register is up to date. We register risk in six categories. Implementation status for mitigation of risks uh, measured also are on track, where all the in the mitigation measures, 20% of the mitigation measures are already implemented, and 71% are well in progress. Um, we have uh, also a streamlined, we are streamlining business continuity in all budget centers, and we will uh, roll out by end of this year a system that will ensure that all budget centers are uh, equipped to up, have up-to-date business continuity plans. When we look at a risk register, risk is looking at outside in. But from inside out, we look at also internal control measurements. For 2018, our internal control measurements have been assessed in all budget centers based on a certain self-assessment process, which is through a checklist. Our measurement shows that there is an average score of 3.64 out of 4 uh, on average, and it is a strong indication of assurance. But at the same time, we are comp now we have the possibility to track and compare the information since 2015-16, and we are comparing now and we see that the evidence shows improved maturity in better understanding of the area and what improvements are required. We are focusing in terms of improvements on certain aspects, and those areas that we are focusing on include in-depth analysis of financial and procurement operations, for all offices, all budget centers. Particular uh, systematic approach for compliance of recruitment of non-staff contracts. M regular systematic reporting to executive management and your to governing bodies uh, of, the, of the European region in much more systematic uh, manner. Particular uh, trainings on areas of management and administration, uh, particular to risk and uh, assurance processes and applications of standard procedures, and uh, regular reviews of offices, in-depth review of offices in terms of the situation in uh, uh, already the actions taken, which now systematically we are uh, applying it in all uh, budget centers of high importance. We also have been able since last year, and this year has been also the second year, we were able to uh, in ensure that all staff, general service and professional staff, with particular part um, responsibilities 
on decision making, particular to procurement of goods and services, have uh, um, rendered declarations of interests uh, 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 for for the year. Now, the third angle comes in here, and the third angle is external validation of what we are doing, and that is the internal and external audit of the re for the for our region. The result of internal and external audits that we have, uh, including for 2018, shows an overall effectiveness of risk management and internal processes. Areas of procurement, fixed asset, compliance, donor agreement are areas that are, we are advised to focus on and uh, improve further. During 2018, in particular, we had two internal audits uh, and one external audit. The internal audit included an internal audit of operations for uh, country office Ukraine with the outcome of satisfactory an integrated audit of the Division of Health Emergencies and Communicable Disease in the regional office with the outcome of partial satisfactory. The external auditors visited regional office and <clears throat> the country office of Kazakhstan and the, overcome, uh, the overall uh, outcome was satisfactory. Their satisfactory report was based on the financial statements presented as fair in all materials of internal controls and effectiveness of um, uh, internal controls both in the country office and the regional office. I would like to only add one additional point here on the way forward as the work is progressing and we will report to you on an annual basis both to the regional committee and in the respective sessions in the standing com for the standing committee of the regional committee. We <coughs> will continue prioritizing benchmarking of key compliance measurements and indicators for integration of these measurements to management dashboard as we are maturing in managing our controls and risks. And further capacity building and trainings uh, will be in place, particularly for business intelligence for decision making. And we will enhance as well the systems that we have in terms of alignments for monitoring and reporting to ensure that staff are monitoring the work and managing better results. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And now I call delegates wishing to take the floor to raise their name plates, please. I see none. So I think, Susan, you, do you have to add anything? No? Thank you very much. The next group of progress reports for consideration are progress report on the action plan for sexual and reproductive health towards achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Europe, leaving no one behind. Progress report on the roadmap to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The reports are in EUR slash RC69 slash 8 D and E. I would like to invite to the top table Dr. Bende Mikkelsen, Dr. Nino Berzuli, Dr. Piroska Ostlin and Dr. Bettina Mene. Firstly, Dr. Bezzuli will deliver a short introductory presentation. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, distinguished Member States representatives, Regional Directors, um, the chair. In 2016, 
at 66th session of the regional committee adopted resolution in which it endorsed the action plan for sexual reproductive health towards achieving the 2030 agenda for leaving no one for sustainable development in Europe, leaving no one behind. The action plan puts forward a vision in the WHO European region as a region in which all people are enabled and supported in achieving their full potential for sexual and reproductive health and well-being, a region where human rights related to sexual and reproductive health are respected, protected and fulfilled, and a region in which countries work individually and jointly to reduce the inequities in sexual and reproductive health and rights. The action plan has three very closely interlinked goals with several objectives and actions. Today we present an information on implementation of the action plan, as well as highlight some of the national policies alignment with the action plan based on member states' responses to the Global Reproductive Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Health Survey Policy Survey of 2018. Detailed responses on these national policies and their alignment with this SRH action plan are included in the progress report. This morning, uh, session on health literacy was very important and the resolution that was adopted as the sexual and reproductive health and the information on sexual and reproductive health is a part of the health literacy. Looking back just 10 years ago when sexuality education was a taboo subject in many countries, the European region has made much progress and the European experience in this field is very valuable. Over half of member states in the European region have policies now that require mandatory comprehensive sexuality education in schools. But more needs to be done to fill the gaps in building the capacity of uh, sexuality educators and sharing the knowledge and the experience to increase uptake of these policies in the region. And we are very closely working to fulfill the goal number one in the SRH action plan with the WHO Collaborating Center, German Federal Center for Health Education, to deliver this goal. Financial barriers may play a very critical role in preventing access to high quality and timely care during pregnancy and the childbirth. The, we, what we found, and the, based on the responses from the member states, the policies for free access to antenatal care, childbirth and newborn care services to all, for all population groups are uh, existing, are, are, are in the European region, most of the European region countries. And this demonstrates the high priority the member states give to the maternal and newborn health. However, despite the progress in reducing the maternal and newborn health, we still have preventable, avoidable maternal deaths and newborn mortality and the major gaps related to the quality of care that contribute to these deaths. And more efforts, of course, needs to be done in several aspects, including the preconception care, improving access to evidence-based preconception care, which is a very important component of the primary health care. Setting age limit in the legislation for adolescents for accessing health services without parental consent can be an obstacle for adolescents to fully realize their rights. Over half of member states provide the legal access to contraception without a parental consent for adolescents under the 18 years of age. However, the availability and the access to quality sexual and reproductive health services for adolescents is still a major gap and, we need, and a major challenge and we need to work on it more as well as the reducing the financial barriers and increasing the access to family planning services and use of contraceptive methods, particularly for vulnerable groups, remains as a priority. In, um, in August 2018, um, WHO Regional Office for Europe, in partnership with um, Public Health Agency of Sweden and Eastern Europe Central Asia Regional Office of the United Nations Population Fund, hold the inter-regional meeting in Stockholm on progress in improving sexual and reproductive health in Europe, which brought the 25 member states. It revamped the commitments from the member states towards the action plan for sexual and reproductive health and increased the interests and the requests that we received from the countries on evaluation of their existing national strategies and development of the new 
once. As a regional director, Dr. Zuzana Jakob said in her opening speech, equity is a major challenge in our region. We work with uh, member states encouraging them to engage the civil society organizations and particularly those representing that particularly representing those that are left behind in the strategy development process, in defining and prioritizing actions and reflecting their needs in their new national strategies. And that's a way how the WHO Europe and the WHO country offices are working in the countries. We have some very good examples of such engagement in several countries where the new sexual and reproductive health strategies were developed. We do have the advocacy and intersectoral policy dialogues at the country level, as well as provide the technical assistance in development of accountability mechanism for advancing the implementation of the action plan. An assessment of sexual and reproductive health in the context of universal health coverage was initiated and completed in six countries of the European region. And this assessment actually is looking and tries to answer these three questions, important questions. Which sexual and reproductive maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health services are included in the universal health coverage policies in specific country context? To what extent these services are available to the people who, to whom they are intended? And what are some of the health system barriers and the challenges to the provision of uh, these services? We, this assessment results actually help the member states in strengthening the policies and service delivery for the progressive realization of the universal access to sexual and reproductive health services. We conducted, as I said, uh, this assessment in six countries and there is an interest from member states to scale this assessment and in 2020 we are planning to do this in six more countries. Sexual and reproductive health is an unfinished agenda for the region and much work remains to be done before the next evaluation of the progress of the action plan implementation in 2023. As Her Royal Highness Crown Princess of Denmark articulated in her opening, tackling the complexity of sexual and reproductive health and rights in constantly challenging political context, context is far from easy. We will continue advocacy in paving the way for prioritization of sexual and, reproductive health, sexual and reproductive health for all at regional and national levels and its progressive realization with evidence-informed action, support of best policy and the practice in the context of delivering integrated universal health care. We, of course, the making deep impact at the country level is possible only through the united action. And we work with uh, regional partners. We, want, we work with, uh, we have a strong collaboration, coordination and a partnership with the UNFPA regional office. We have very strong partnership with uh, UNICEF in implementing in countries uh, the action plan goals and objectives. And of course, the GPW 13 provides the unique opportunity for us to advance the achievements of sexual and reproductive health action plan goals and related sustainable development goals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bajuli. Now, Dr. Mene, coordinator of sustainable development and health, has a brief presentation for us on the SDGs progress report. Dr. Mene, you have the floor. Um, Boris, do you have by chance the <laughs> This, Your Excellency, distinguished heads of delegations, regional director, partners and dear colleagues. First, maybe if we put on the presentation, excellent. First, let me thank the regional director for her believing in sustainable development and the heartfelt continuous support you have to providing to this matter, as well as by Dr. Piroshka Östlin and also all the heads of the UN agencies, the regional offices which are here present, our partners and collaborators, and of course to all of you who have been implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. In September 2017, the roadmap to implement the 
2030 agenda was endorsed. We were lucky because we had health 2020. We had a quick start. The roadmap is slightly building, it is building on health 2020, but it has a few more strategic objectives. And it goes such as universal health coverage, such as leaving no one behind, such as establishing healthy places and working with the communities and strengthening health systems towards um, universal health coverage, as well as providing governance. It also has four enablers, and one of those was actually approved yesterday, the health literacy, no, today, the health literacy roadmap development. Um, now, the question we posed ourselves, because we were asked to report every two years until 2029. Huh? So this is the first report we are actually delivering. So the, the first question we asked ourselves is, where are we? We are currently developing an SDG health target report. We have more than 50 health targets in the sustainable development agenda. We are just showing here the 13 health targets we have in SDG 3. It's clear we, have, we are making progress and we are advancing very rapidly and have been advancing over the last 20 years in a number of areas like maternal health, child health and so forth. There's one goal, one target, sorry, we are not able to achieve because it's a target for 2020 and we're just the one on road traffic accident. Nor globally, nor in the region, nor in most, not in all, but in most of the countries. For all the other targets, a lot of issues need to be further done. Interventions must be scaled up. The other health targets and the other goals particularly worrisome are violence against children and the lack of progress in, for example, reducing mortality from air pollution, just to mention a few. Um, however, there are a few very good news. All of you are working on sustainable development. And the big issue here is that 43 countries have actually developed the voluntary national reviews. And not only these are developed at the highest level of government, you have set up institutional processes. And from the questionnaires we have got back, actually we also, sorry, we also see that practically um, SDG focal points have been assigned in most of your health ministries. And this is a fantastic news within these two years. The, there are a few key messages from the VNRs, the Voluntary National Reviews. First of all, that all countries are progressing on sustainable development with very similar but also differential priorities. They range from the green economy up to human capital. All countries report on health, but still in many it is reported as a silo thinking, healthcare. More and more, as I was saying already, have nominated already SDG focal points. A wide range of institutional mechanisms and even auditing has been set up in countries. And one of the issues is that the implementation is clearly assigned to the line ministries. But there's very often a lack of budgeting to the line ministries on the SDGs. These are preliminary results on the 43 countries from the VNR reporting, but we thought important to know as health is part of those development. An analysis of the targets which are most frequently mentioned in the 43 voluntary national reviews, we find that universal health coverage, health financing and non-communicable diseases are the most frequently mentioned. Beyond SDG 3, access to basic services, the integration of climate change measures into development, into policies and the global partnership are the ones most frequently me uh, mentioned. There is often a, a lack of alignment between the national development, the VNRs, and the national health policies. However, as many of those are redeveloped in the years to come, there is a hope and a big scope for this to happen. On the health determinants, it's also very apparent that no health is considered in the action, or very rarely considered in the action of other sectors or in the achievement of other goals. But and even less the throughout the life course. 
which we perceive on transport, on energy, on environmental matters, on water and sanitation, just to think about the school, the lack of access of clean water in schools, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we think there could be more efforts being done. There's also an issue about policy coherence for sustainable development, which is starting to consider health, but it would be great. Uh, we could be seeing more coherence towards health in the national development um, aspects. An analysis uh, by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the VNRs highlighted that most countries mentioned the concept of leaving no one behind. But few refer to explicit strategies, participation by vulnerable groups, and the commitment to reach the people furthest behind. In the European region, we have an exceptional knowledge on how to do. And this was presented at this regional committee. And I think the basket of opportunities which have been presented give, give us a fantastic head start in actually moving ahead and getting this further done. Another aspect we looked at is the financing of sustainable development. Huge debate, as you can imagine, but the result is that SDG financing mainly is part, relies on national budgets. So it's a matter of distribution, of mobilizing resources and a matter of distribution. It's also very rarely distributed, as I said earlier, in the annual budget cycles. Foreign direct investment is the largest source of external financing in some of the Eastern European countries. And development assistance has very little increased over the recent years, as you could see from the slide on the, on the figure on the left side. And as you well know, very few European countries are actually benefiting from this. The next one, sorry, yeah. You see, it's a very little 1% increase. One of the big advantages forthcoming in the work is the partnership dimension. And this is the work of the Small Country Initiative. And they are showcasing examples from a numerous goals, which are really um, fantastic. And we have many more of these partnerships and showcases and case studies forthcoming. And we are very grateful to all of you who have submitted those to us. And we can learn, we can further share the learning experiences. Um, we are also advancing, and I'm very pleased, on the JMF, on the Joint Monitoring Framework, of course, also in cooperation with the Global Impact Framework of Geneva. But still, there are, as you well know, discrepancies available. It will be soon uh, launched on our gateway. But still, the issue of increasing health information, uh, stronger accessibility, uh, reducing administrative burden, fewer discrepancies between the different databases, and more efficient uses of resources needs to be improved. We also questioned what, what are we mainly working in in our countries? And that's also very interesting in order to implement the SDGs. The biggest Issues in, the, in uh, our heads of offices responded were actually the implementation of UHC, health financing and the legal aspects. This is the top on the left. While, uh, for example, strengthening health information systems for the SDGs or other areas could further uh, need progress or could be further improved, such as also the capacity development of our health workforce on the SDGs. And last but not least, we also have partnerships across the UN agencies through the regional directors coordination mechanism. And I'm very grateful to Shoshana who has been part of this and even leading for some months these initiatives. We also have the issue-based coalition on health and well-being, which is a partnership of the UN agencies working. We are also working on the gap contributed to the global action plan, which will be launched uh, for healthy lives, which will be launched at the General Assembly. But there's much more. It's the health cities, the, the, the coalition of public health, which is now also increasing the work on SDGs, the regions for health, the Southeast European network, the small country initiative, just to mention a few. And all the meetings we have organized, we always had SDGs as one of the agenda item or as the cross-cutting development item uh, of our discussion. Okay, and I would like to uh, stop here. We are, a lot of work is forthcoming on a toolbox 
or um, Hans called it a toolbox, uh, but it's the SDG resources, guide to the resources across the whole of the organization, across with all partners and offices. We are also we also want to do more on the capacity development uh, and we would like to get the SDG focal points together and talk through on what is really more needed within the support to your country, particularly now that some of our 18 country, 17 countries are going through the new development cycle and the cooperation agreements for the next five years. I would like to stop here and I hope we will be continuing for, we have some time, the next 10 years, <laughs> to work together. And to conclude by a sentence of the Secretary General, he in his launched document of yesterday, the future is now, and he says, we must connect the dots across all we do, as individuals, as civic groups, as corporations, as municipalities and as member states and truly embrace the principles of inclusion and sustainability. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Mene. I open the floor immediately. Delegates wishing to take the floor should raise their name, please. Slovenia, please. Followed by Austria. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> we have been carefully listening now for several days. Um, um, and uh, one of the things that appeared uh, to our delegation was that there were at several occasions young people asked to be able to contribute and to, uh, to want to get involved in these processes actively. And somebody also said, help for all, with all. And that is why I'm asking uh, both uh, Dr. Mene and Dr. Berzuil, how are you going to assure that young people, and we have organized young people, it's not just young people in general, they can be medical students, but there is also a youth health organization in European um, uh, part uh, of the world that you could uh, invite and how and when are you going to do this? This is my question. Thank you. Austria, please, followed by Slovakia. Uh, Mr. President, we agree with this thing which Dr. Menne and Dr. Berzuli that Europe is very variable. Slovakia is fully committed to implement the measures to achieve the best approaches to sexual and reproductive health towards achieving the 2030 agenda, leaving no one behind. We would like to thank to the, to the Secretariat for the attention to this important agenda and work on the progress report uh, document. Regarding the point 25 of the progress report document that deals with services without parental consent, we would like to stress that any recommendation or provision of the action plan or its following documents and reports should not in any way create an obligation on any party to abandon the responsibility of parents or legal guardians for the health of children and adolescents, as well as common existing legal acts. We would like to remind the 72nd World Health Assembly report on global strategy for women's, children's, adolescents' health, mentioning global platform on essential policies on sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health. We would like to know more about the global platform and the European region part in it. Slovakia would like to see the evidence on country measures, standardized approaches and clinical guidelines to support the current methods of fertility control, diagnostic and treatment, including natural methods within the global platform. Further, we would like to remind that Slovakia submitted reservations and explanatory comments on several issues of the action plan. With regard to the action plan, Slovakia interprets the issues related to sexual and reproductive health in line with national health legislation and common practices, and specifically, consensus objection, informed consent of parents or legal guardians for all medical procedures, reimbursement of contraception, emergency contraception, and surrogate motherhood. Mr. President, we would like to place on the record observations and explanatory comments of Slovakia on this agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Slovakia. Uh, Austria, please, followed by Sweden. 
Danke, Herr Vorsitzender. Ich beziehe mich auf den, die Förderung des der Fortschrittsbericht zur Förderung der sexuellen und reproduktiven Gesundheit. Die im Dokument dargestellten Strategien und die drei Zielsetzungen des Aktionsplans spiegeln sich im Ziel 2 der Gesundheitsziele Österreichs wider. Gesundheitliche Chancengleichheit zwischen den Geschlechtern und sozioökonomischen Gruppen, Unabhängigkeit von, unabhängig von der Herkunft für alle Altersgruppen. Die sexuelle und reproduktive Gesundheit von Mädchen und Frauen wird im österreichischen Aktionsplan für Frauengesundheit, der an die WHO-Ziele der Strategy, Strategy on Women's Health and Wellbeing in der WHO European Region anknüpft, besonders berücksichtigt. Österreich nimmt als das erste europäische Land mit einem entsprechenden Aktionsplan eine Vorreiterrolle in Europa ein. Die Förderung und Unterstützung der sexuellen Gesundheit und die Umsetzung von Maßnahmen zur Verstärkung der Beratungsangebote zur Schwangerschaftsverhütung sind unter anderem Themenschwerpunkte des Aktionsplans Frauengesundheit. Im Rahmen des jährlich stattfindenden Frauengesundheitsdialogs, der zum österreichweiten bereichs- und länderübergreifenden Austausch in der Umsetzung des Aktionsplans eingerichtet wurde, findet das Thema der sexualisierten Gewalt gegen Frauen besondere Aufmerksamkeit. Beim Frauengesundheitsdialog 2019 war die Gewährleistung des allgemeinen Zugangs zur sexuellen und reproduktiven Gesundheit eine Schlüsselbotschaft. Abschließend möchte ich, und das aus guten Gründen, in Hinblick auf das globale relevante Thema der sexuellen und reproduktiven Gesundheit und Rechte anmerken, dass die Member States nicht hinter den einmal gewonnenen Konsens zurückfallen sollen, der auf regionaler bzw. auch auf globaler Ebene getroffen wurde. Mit einem solchen Rückschritt würden multilaterale Verhandlungsprozesse stark beeinträchtigt werden. Für Österreich zählt der einmal erzielte Fortschritt zum fixen Kanon von Frauenrechten und anderen vulnerablen gesellschaftlichen Gruppen. Danke vielmals. Thank you, Austria. Sweden, please, followed by Spain. Thank you, Chair. Sweden thanks the Secretariat for the report and the hard work in the important area of sexual and reproductive health and rights. At times when already agreed commitments on human rights, including SRHR, are being increasingly questioned, the SRH Action Plan of WHO Europe plays an important role in highlighting the need for sexual and reproductive health and rights in the European region, as well as catalyzing change also beyond Europe. Sexual and reproductive health and rights strongly affect people's health. It is an area of great importance for self-esteem, close relations, and well-being of every individual. Sexual and reproductive health and rights is also a prerequisite for women's empowerment and therefore fundamental to a gender equal society. Consequently, it is with mixed feelings we take part of the results in the progress report. It is unsatisfactory to learn that less than half of the member states participating in the survey lack policies or laws requiring mandatory comprehensive sexuality education. It is, however, encouraging that over 80% of responding member states have national policies referencing gender-based violence, among others. Overall, we are concerned over the low level of member states responding to the global, reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health policy survey of 2018. As a stark proponent of universal health coverage, Sweden supports the conclusion that universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights is crucial for European region to achieve all sustainable development goals. In the continuous work of implementing the strategy, we would like to highlight the newly recommended definition of SRHR launched by the Guttmacher Institute in close collaboration with the Lancet as a source for inspiration. Furthermore, we must to a greater extent include boys and men. The interlinkages with the strategy on the health and well-being of men in the WHO European region is therefore important. Finally, I am happy to report 
that in the budget bill from the government presented to the parliament yesterday, we now have funds allocated to introduce HPV vaccination also for boys in the national vaccination program from 2020. To conclude, we want to underline that Sweden is deeply committed to continue our active contribution to a successful implementation of the SRH action plan. Thank you. Thank you. Spain, please. Thank you, Chair. Spain welcomes the, this progress report on the action plan for sexual and reproductive health towards achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Europe, leaving no one behind. Aligned with this action plan, Spain has updated the national strategy on sexual health with a new operating plan for the period 2019-2020 in response to the new challenges in the strategy was adopted back in 2011. I would like to highlight two aspects. First, our efforts in coordinating health activities responding to gender-based violence as mandated by Act 1-2004 and comprehensive protection measures against gender-based violence with a common protocol for the national health system. And second, related to Spanish commitment to leave no one behind is reflected in the fact that single women and women's couples recover the right to access to assisted reproductive techniques between the public health system in Spain in, in this year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Spain. As I see no other delegate asking for the floor, I give the floor to the United Nations Population Fund. Mr. Chair, Madam Regional Director, Distinguished Delegates, UNFPA is pleased to have the opportunity to make the statement on progress reports related to both the implementation of European Action Plan for Sexual Reproductive Health, leaving no one behind, and the Regional Action Plan for Health Sector Response to HIV. Each fundamental for achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Europe. The European Sexual Reproductive Health Action Plan, which builds on the ICPD and SDGs, is an excellent tool to drive the progress on achieving universal access to sexual reproductive health and rights in this region. We wish to recognize member states for their efforts and cooperation in developing the national SRH action plans and congratulate European Union member states and six member states of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Albania, Georgia, Moldova, North Macedonia, Serbia, and Tajikistan, and four countries who are expected to finalize their action plans this year. The implementation of the regional SRH action plan is also an excellent example of WHO and UNFPA collaboration. Since the endorsement of the action plan, UNFP and WHO regional offices have been providing joint technical support to countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia to accelerate development and implementation. Thanks to support from Sweden, we also had the opportunity to come together last year with European member states in a very productive conference in Stockholm, which led to accelerated action. We'd like to take this opportunity and to thank Dr. Mikkelsen and Dr. Berzulli for collaboration. We encourage all countries in the region to develop or update their national SRH action plans in line with the vision of the regional SRH action plan, leaving no one behind. I would also like to acknowledge the progress made in implementation of the regional action plan for health sector response to HIV. As an active partner of issue-based coalition on health and regional EMTCT validation committee, UNFP acknowledges the concrete results achieved by member states, particularly in the elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. However, we still have miles to go in order to end HIV by 2030, especially among key populations and other most vulnerable and marginalized groups. We hope that many achievements and commitments to speed up progress will be expressed during the upcoming Nairobi Summit, ICPD 25, accelerating the progress in November 2019. I would like to once again reiterate UNFPA's willingness to support member states in their aspiration to achieve universal access to sexual and reproductive health and thank WHO Europe for partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
And now I give the floor for a joint statement to uh, in the National Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine and some other organizations. Thank you, Mr. Chair and distinguished uh, delegates. Uh, the International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine, Center for Regional Policy Research and Cooperation, the Council for Occupational Therapies, the World Federation of Occupational Therapies, the International Alliance of Patient Organizations, and Medical Women International celebrates the effort of the European Regional Committee in the development of an action plan for sexual and reproductive health. However, not with concern the notorious absence of persons with disabilities as a specific development group. Even if in the resolution RC6CC uh, R7, member states were urged to implement the action plan and reduce the, bur the burden of illness in their population, given particular attention to vulnerable, disadvantaged, and hard to reach group, the special approach of the sexual and reproductive health that pe person with disability needs was not considered in the action plan, or at least not explicitly named in the progress report document RC69 HD. Article 25 of the CRPD states that state parties shall provide persons with disabilities with the same range, quality, and standards of free and affordable health care and programs as provide to other persons, including in the area of sexual and reproductive health and population-based public health programs. In 2009, WHO wrote in its report on sexual and reproductive health for persons with disabilities that persons with disabilities have the same sexual and reproductive health needs as other people, yet they often face barriers to information and service. The ignorance and attitude of society and individuals, including healthcare providers, raise most of these barriers, not the disability themselves. Increasing awareness is the first and big step. But sadly, since that this reality 10 years later is not different. People with disability have special needs to achieve full enjoyment of sexuality, special needs in contraception, childbirth and postnatal care, special need for access to assistive reproductive technology, and continue to have huge barriers to accessing sexual and reproductive health programs such as cervix or breast cancer detection. We urge the regional committee to include people with disabilities as a specific work group and to carry out a European sexual and reproductive health survey that includes people with disability. We urge member states to develop national policies on sexual and reproductive health, especially aimed at persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. And now our next joint statement of the World Stroke Organizations and other organizations. Good afternoon. My name is Hanne Christensen, and I'm Professor of Neurology in Copenhagen. I'm happy to present the oral statement of the World Stroke Organization. Recent studies have convincingly shown that stroke is gaining grounds in several European countries. One in four will have a stroke during their lifetime, and I've actually not yet at this meeting heard the word uh, stroke being spoken. These three Stroke and NCD-related issues need urgent attention in Europe. The 10 modifiable risk factors that are linked to up to 90% of strokes, including hypertension, smoking, alcohol consumption, physical inactivity and unhealthy diet, need to be approached. We need to act. Stroke patients need dedicated stroke unit care. Stroke action plans are needed to increase stroke awareness as well as access to treatment and long-term care. WSO calls upon WHO Europe and the European UN member states to increase their efforts against stroke in three domains. Better implementation of population-wide prevention strategies for stroke and NCDs. Universal access to stroke unit care, including essential medicines, medical devices, including endovascular therapy, rehabilitation and long-term care, and supporting the Stroke Action Plan for Europe to, to guide policy decisions on all aspects of stroke. In summary, WSO strongly support WHO Europe's effort to upscale actions in reducing the burden of stroke and other NCDs, and ask that the specific actions highlighted in this statement should specifically be considered. Thank you. 
Now the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. Honourable Chair, distinguished delegates, this statement is delivered by the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists with the support of the International Federation of Medical Students Associations. Universal access to safe anesthesia and safe surgery is crucial to the Sustainable Development Goal 3.8 on universal health coverage, and yet five out of the world's seven billion people lack access to safe, affordable, and timely anesthesia and surgical care. Good health and well-being cannot be achieved without a scaling up of surgical services worldwide, as outlined in the unanimously passed WHA Resolution 6815 on strengthening emergency and essential surgical care and anesthesia as a component of universal health coverage. The WFSA therefore suggests three recommendations to the 69th session of the WHO Regional Committee for Europe. Firstly, show leadership as urged in the roadmap to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in the highest attainable standard of health and well-being, recognising that this cannot be achieved without safe and affordable anaesthesia care. Secondly, include safe anaesthesia and safe surgery in the discourse of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is estimated that each year, more than four times as many people die from surgical conditions than HIV, tuberculosis and malaria combined. And thirdly, Promote the formulation and implementation of national surgical, obstetric and anaesthesia plans within countries, demonstrating commitment to achieving Sustainable Development Goal 3, Target 3.8 on achieving universal health coverage, and reminding them of the important role of safe anaesthesia and surgery in reaching this objective. Thank you. IOGT, please, international and now. Honorable Chairperson, distinguished delegates, um, I thank you for the opportunity to address you on behalf of IOGT International and our 46 member organizations in 21 countries of this region. At the World Health Assembly this May, Romania delivered a statement on behalf of the EU on agenda item implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, clearly addressing alcohol-related harm as an obstacle to development calling for more action to address well-documented gaps. 13 of 17 SDGs and more than 50 SDG targets are adversely affected by alcohol. Taking systematic action therefore promises substantial co-benefits across the 2030 agenda. The SDGs clearly require a system change towards preventing problems from occurring and expanding. New Eurostat data shows that alcohol is one of the top preventable killers in Europe, disproportionately affecting young people and increasingly harming older people in our region. As such, the new WHO SAFER initiative provides an excellent toolbox for a life course approach through five cost-effective and scientifically proven interventions. Especially alcohol taxation has been shown to directly help achieve at least 11 SDGs. It is the single most impactful alcohol policy measure and yet recent WHO data shows that pricing policies remain the lowest priority across our region. Given the significant cross-sectorial benefits, the potential for domestic resource mobilization, the substantial return on investment, the unimpeachable science for the alcohol policy best buys, and given the heavy burden of alcohol harm across the life course, we call on member states and WHO in our region to make to better mainstream action on preventing and reducing alcohol-related harm and to ensure policy coherence in favor of the SDGs. IOGT International remains committed to support WHO and member states to achieve health and development for all through the alcohol policy best buys. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now International Federation of Medical Students Association. Thank you, Chair. We are speaking on behalf of more than 1.3 million medical students around the world that advocate for the global movement to achieve sustainable development goals. Highly supporting the WHO in promoting a multi-sectorial and coordinated approach to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, 
we would like to draw your attention to a few crucial points. Our region today has the highest burden of multidrug resistant tuberculosis of all WHO regions and is not on track to meet the HIV target. Strengthen national surveillance and research on antimicrobial resistance by supporting innovation is an essential step that requires commitment from all European countries. HIV issues could be addressed by raising awareness and nationally ensuring accessible contraception, bringing testing and treatment for all who need it. The achievement of the goal to reduce non-communicable diseases by one-third by 2030 is close. However, the prevalence of mental health disorders lately increased in the region, and suicide rates remain unacceptably high. We urge member states to increase funding for mental health services and psychiatric research, particularly with regards to youth and adolescents. We also call you to participate and encourage education and advocacy activities that are geared towards universal health coverage because health systems need to be further and continuously strengthened to achieve it. Conducting regular reviews of the progress on the 2030 agenda requires the establishment of national statistics networks and offices responsible for collecting, monitoring and analyzing data on SDGs indicators. Therefore, we urge you to also involve youth representatives in this important process and empower future generations in health decision making. All of that would strengthen the capacities of member states to achieve better and more equitable and sustainable health and well-being for all at all ages in the WHO European region. Thank you. Thank you. Now the World Federation of Neurology, please. Honorable Chair, Regional Director, Distinguished Delegates, uh, this is a statement of the World Federation of Neurology on the needs of patients in Europe living with neurological disease. I would like to uh, continue where my uh, distinguished colleague from the World Stroke Organization has ended. Also stroke being a neurological disease, but we want to point out that also other neurological disease affects similar neglect also, unfortunately, across several European countries. Let me say that neurological disorders comprise disease of the brain and the neuromuscular system and represent a significant part of the non-communicable diseases. They vary greatly in the symptoms, weakness, loss of sensation, poor coordination, seizures, confusion, pain, cognitive deficits and alters levels of consciousness. Uh, and the neurological diseases, particularly uh, affect, affect the elderly population and the incidence and prevalence grows in our aging world. The data from the Global Burden of Disease database clearly shows the great burden also in Europe. According to the data, more than half of the European population, approximately 60%, suffers from a neurological disease. The death and disease burden due to neurological diseases is high and ranks number three among all diseases groups in Europe. However, major advances in prevention, diagnosis and treatment of many neurological diseases have been achieved or are on the horizon. Unfortunately, the advances in prevention and in treatment uh, are not equally accessible to patients across Europe. And the same holds true for other neurological diseases as for stroke. Attention must be paid towards the equity of access to neurological care. In, um, in European countries with lower income, less health costs are covered, and it's, it is often compensated by an increase in, an, in the out-of-pocket payments that rise disproportionately to the income. All patients should have access to neurological diagnosis and treatment, including new therapies, the high costs of new treatments must be offset by appropriate organizational efforts by the health system. Uh, one of the key elements for accepting preventive measures, seeking early diagnosis and appropriate use of therapies is the education of patients, their carers and also all health professionals. In a wider perspective, the public. Uh, efforts in this direction are certainly made by the World Federation of neurology and the regional organizations. Patients and carers need to be empowered in the journey with neurological disease based on fairness. They should have equal access 
to neurological care where necessary and strong support by appropriately educated primary care physicians and other health workers. The WFN respectfully asks the European Member States, the European WHO Headquarters and the WHO European Office for Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases to address the growing burden of neurological disease, uh, which demands concentrated efforts by national health systems to follow example of good practice from some of the countries. And I would just like to point out the brain plan adopted by Norway. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And now the age platform Europe, please. Dear Mr. Chair, distinguished delegates, regional director, thank you for giving us the floor. I represent Age Platform Europe, a European network of non-for-profit organizations working for older persons and with older persons age 50 plus, which aims to voice and promote their interests at EU level. Looking ahead to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we would like to re reinforce the link with the proposed initiative laid by by the WHO and presented this morning, namely the Decade of Healthy Aging. We consider it as a strong tool to reach the Sustainable Development Goals and we call on European countries to support this cross-sectoral and multi-stakeholders initiative. Considering the long-standing experience of Europe in relation to aging and the work done so far by the WHO Regional Office for Europe, notably with the Strategy and Action Plan for Healthy Aging in Europe 2012-2020, it can certainly play a leading role, leading role sorry, for sharing its expertise while learning from other regions uh, during such a decade. To take two examples, there will be a great added value in building stronger synergies between the work carried out by the European Healthy Cities Network and the global network of age friendly cities and communities. Similarly, the Europe region could play a leading role to ensure a holistic and coordinated approach of long-term care, promoting well-being, autonomy and independence and community inclusion of older persons. Together with other international organizations such as ILO and the OECD, WHO Regional Office for Europe could support the development of methodologies measuring the cost of inaction in that area. We, Age Platform Europe, are ready to support WHO Regional Office for Europe and European countries to achieve the highest attainable level of health, leaving no one behind, including older persons. We thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And now our last joint statement of the International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine, please. Thank you, sir. Um, the International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine, Center for Regional Policy Research and Cooperation, the World Confederation for Physical Therapy, the World Federation of Occupational Therapy, the International Alliance of Patient Organization, the European Federation of Association of Dieticians, the Worldwide Hospice of Palliative Care, the Council for Occupational Therapies, and AGE, celebrates the effort of the European Regional Committee in the development of the roadmap to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and suggest taking into account the growing burden of disease that disabled health condition may represent for the region and the number of people who can benefit from rehabilitation. In the world, greater effort have been made to reduce more mortality than to reduce disability. At the second Global Rehabilitation 2030 meeting at WHO last July, it was stated that based on the global burden of disease, 2.4 billion people worldwide may benefit from rehabilitation. And please listen to this. The Global Burden of Disease Study of 2015 estimates a modest 2% reduction in the age standardized rate of years live with disability for all causes, compared with a 22.7 reduction in age standardized rates of year of life loss for all causes between 2005 and 2015. Age standardized years live with disability rates for all conditions combined were 10.4%, being higher in women than in men. 
In the European, the leading, the leading 10 causes were back pain, falls, migraine, hearing loss, major depression disorder, neck pain, stroke, diabetes, musculoskeletal problems, and alcohol abuse. We strongly support the WHO Rehabilitation 2030 initiative and its statement that there is still a substantial and ever-increasing unmet need for rehabilitation worldwide, the ability of accessible and affordable rehabilitation is necessary for many people with health conditions to remain as independent as possible, participate, get education, be economically productive and fulfill meaningful life roles. The magnitude and scope of unmet rehabilitation need signal an urgent demand for concerted and coordinated global action by stakeholders. And there is also an urgent need to know and understand the role that different professionals in the area of rehabilitation have in achieving these goals. For this to work, the WHO European Regional Committee and its member states must understand rehabilitation as the most important health strategy to reduce years live with disability and to improve the health and well-being of its population. Thank you. Thank you. I inform that I will have two written statements received. One joint statement of the European Alcohol Policy and other organizations and one of the World Hepatitis Alliance. And now please, Dr. Bejuli, uh, Dr. Mene, uh, please give short and uh, necessary answers. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, the Member States, for your valuable comments. We thank um, Austria, Sweden and Spain for your commitment and forward-looking agenda for sexual and reproductive health and support for the WHO SRH action plan. Um, with regard to the comment from Sweden on response rate to survey, it was 73%. Of course, we would like to see more a response from the member states' countries to policy surveys because it gives us an understanding of uh, the progress with regard to the SRH uh, national policies and the actions that we need to undertake together to advance on this agenda. Um, on uh, the definition uh, for sexual and reproductive health, uh, again, the comment from uh, the Sweden and using the Gutmacher uh, um, WHO um, um, the definition that was used in the Gutmacher WHO Joint Commission in the Lancet. Uh, I would like to stress that the definition that was used in that uh, commission paper we are using for the assessments that I mentioned in our presentation when assessing the um, country's progress to, towards universal access to sexual and reproductive health services. We are using that definition in assessing the country national policies. Um, and uh, finally, the comment uh, from Slovenia on young people engagement in the development of sexual and reproductive health uh, national strategy. So the action plan, very valuable comment, and we fully support your uh, statement. And it is critical for advancing the agenda for sexual and reproductive health and not only. Um, youth participation was ensured in um, our meeting in 2018 in Sweden. We are, when we are working in countries with member states, we, in developing of uh, their new national strategies and action plans, we encourage the member states to involve the youth organizations, the civil society organizations and the local youth member organizations representatives in uh, the process of development national strategies and prioritize, prioritize, prioritizing uh, their uh, concerns and reflecting them in their national action plans. And we plan to, and we have very good examples from some countries. We have a very um, uh, good example from Moldova, Georgia, that uh, recently developed their national strategies and action plans where the youth participation was ensured and was participatory in the national strategies development. And uh, we uh, would like to uh, further stress that we are going to further accelerate this collaboration and make sure that the youth are the key uh, constituencies involved in the development of the national strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. I will be answering to the comment on the use. Um, 
as very important. And we have been trying to work with the different youth associations. We even uh, generated a request to the youth, particularly starting with the ones on environment, but later on also on equity, to understand how we could be better supporting and what would what would you like to know? What are the issues you were asked to flag out? We have developed a youth brochure with the key topics they have been coming back to us as a mechanism. Um, also in the different platforms, we had IFMSA engaged in the writing actually, and in the feedback from the different uh, associations. We also invited uh, the youth representatives to the different panels, in particular the one on equity the, in the most recent um, conference. However, I would like to agree that the better engagement is extremely fundamental and we are looking very much to feedback on how to best really do this, considering the many youth groups also now next week present, for example, at the General Assembly. So thanks very much.